Hi, I'm Brian Mitchell, director of Hack Civil Media, and today I'm sitting down with Peter Rojas, the founder of Engadget and Gizmodo, and, and the VP of Strategy for AOL here at the TomTom Founder Summit. Peter, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. So, I have to be honest, I am a complete fanboy. <laughs> um, I grew up reading Engadget, reading Gizmodo. Wow, and thank you. Really, the tech blogs that you founded inspired my love for technology. Wow, uh, that's that's great to hear. I'm, you know, I was always um, for me, Gizmodo and Engadget were just sites that, in a way, I did for myself, and that I just was a big nerd about gadgets and technology, and I kind of wanted to have the site that uh, I wanted to create the site that I always wanted to, have, to be able to read, which was uh, something that was uh, as passionate and as focused uh, on this stuff as I was, and that. I wanted just to read about all the cool new gadgets that were being announced every day and, and I wanted the rumors and I wanted the speculation and I wanted the, um, you know, I followed gadgets like other people followed sports teams and so um, uh, it was kind of funny to me that that didn't exist and it kind of, you know, almost accidentally ended up, um, you know, creating something that other people liked. It wasn't necessarily that I set out to have something that millions of other people would read, uh, now tens of millions I guess. but. Uh, it was really something that I thought maybe uh, like you know a few hundred other people would be interested in. So give us some insight um, into the time in between uh, your founding and directorship of Gizmodo and then your founding of Engadget. Well there wasn't actually that much time in between. Um, technically there was uh, a time where I was doing both that uh, has been uh, hard to explain to people but uh, so I created uh, Gizmodo with um, someone a guy named Nick Denton uh, it was an idea that we'd had uh, I had known him back in uh, San Francisco where I was a technology journalist and we both moved to New York about the same time in fact I actually remember um, helping to convince him to move to New York from San Francisco he was also thinking about moving uh, either to London or LA and we were just hanging out one day we were both uh, had personal blogs and we were really interested in blogging. This was early 2002 and uh, we're talking about uh, where blogging might go and, and, and kind of came up with the idea for Gizmodo. It wasn't called Gizmodo at the time, it took us a little while to find a name, but we uh, loved this one blog called Wi-Fi Networking News, which was a blog that was just about Wi-Fi, which sounds kind of crazy now, but at the time Wi-Fi was very new, uh, most people didn't have it, Their, most computers didn't have it, and uh, this guy, Glenn Fleischman, had started a blog that was just about Wi-Fi, all the new developments in Wi-Fi and, and the standards and all the new devices that were getting it. And we realized if you could, uh, you know, take advantage of, of blogging, which was essentially a cheap self-publishing platform, to be able to create a niche publication around just Wi-Fi, that maybe we could do one about another topic. And uh, I'd been a technology journalist for a few years and um, really loved gadgets and so did Nick and so we said okay let's do one about gadgets like that seems like something that um, people are interested in there's not really a site about gadgets which sounds kind of crazy now and um, you know we could talk about it in the way that I wanted to talk about it it was not something that was aimed at a mass audience it was something that because it was a blog we could be very more direct much more personal and kind of talk up to an audience rather than talk down to the audience. And so um, I did that for a couple of years. Um, you know, as Gizmodo started to grow, Nick and I had a, I guess maybe just best described as a disagreement over um, maybe like the vision or scope for the blog. He wanted, uh, and Gizmodo predated Gawker Media, this is getting really in the weeds, but um, his vision for Gawker Media was a network of blogs, each with one part-time editor who also did something else. And, and I did other writing and freelance work, uh, journalism and things like that while I was doing Gizmodo. Um, and my idea was, I really believe in this platform. I think that there's a bl blogging could take on Wired, take on CNET, really become this big thing. And I wanted to work on it full-time. I wanted it to be the only thing I worked on. I wanted to build a team. I wanted to really uh, uh, explore the potential of blogging and, and Nick was a little more skeptical about blogging as something that could become a business. He had actually another startup he was working on that was uh, his main focus at the time. And so I was approached um, a few months before leaving Gizmodo by uh, Jason Kilcanis who was um, getting ready to build a new blog network called Weblogs Inc. And he said, join me, become a partner, 
we'll launch in Gadget, some other bunch of you know other sites, and and I want this to be big, and um, you know it was uh, uh, you know Jason's vision and sort of my vision were uh, more compatible, and so I joined him and his other partner Brian Alvey to start uh, to basically get Weblogs Inc off the ground, and we launched in Gadget as sort of the flagship uh, flagship site. And so my last day at Gizmodo was also my first day at Engadget. <laughs> so I kind of jumped from one to the other uh, very quickly. I see. So there's kind of this apotheosized uh, you know, college dropout story, found a billion dollar startup uh, after you drop out of college. Yeah. Um, it's things like the Teal Fellowship, um, various accelerators and incubators that are really providing some compelling alternatives um, to, the, to a four year university for a young founder. Um, so I, I wonder what you think um, the place of an undergraduate education is um, in today's you know in, in today's world for the rising entrepreneur. Well, um, I think that just having gone you know I mean I, I went to college and then even went on to grad school and have a master's degree. So I, I'm a big believer in education. Um, I frankly think that the idea that if you're young you would turn down the opportunity to have four years of the least amount of responsibility in your life and the most access to other intelligent, smart people, and uh, whether they're professors or other students, uh, and be able to pursue something intellectually and kind of have a, some sort of pure intellectual pursuit for, for you know, four years. Um, I mean, I, I wish that I could do that now, right? I wish that I could go take four years and go to college and, uh, and for, you know, follow that. So I really feel like, um, you know, to be able to have that freedom to uh, engage intellectually with something, whatever it is, um, is an opportunity that I wouldn't, you know, I, I would I would think should be open to as many people as possible. I wouldn't necessarily want to go jump right into, you know, building a business at 19 or 20. I actually think having that freedom at that age is something that's very hard to get back when you're older. Hmm. Um, it's not that you can't do something on the side or do something right after you finish school, but I, I think that, you know, for me, um, the intellectual development that I was able to do uh, with my undergraduate and then graduate, you know, schooling um, was really important for me being able to figure out what, what was important and what I wanted to do. And I think has given me a real, I think edge isn't the right word, but I think that, um, I think that my ability to think critically and, and, and analytically um, is... I mean, really, the only skill I have, and I, and I think that uh, if I hadn't gone to you know if I hadn't gone to college, I wouldn't have it. Mm. So, one of your new roles at AOL is heading up Alpha, this uh, experimental product development team, I suppose, uh, starting off with a focus in the mobile space. Mm -hmm. um, and I read your your personal blog and oh, one of your recent blog posts. Uh, I just want to re read a quote from um, from your, one of your most recent blog posts. Uh, you say, our strategy with Alpha is to try and build as many quality products as possible, as quickly as possible, and in the most startup-like way we're able to. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the advantages of having a nimble unit like Alpha carved into a larger corporate structure like AOL. Well, it's, um, I think that it's difficult for larger companies to create uh, innovative new products. I think that there are big companies that are good at building the next version of the last thing they did or something similar. So if you're Procter & Gamble, you know how to make you know, a new detergent, right? Even if it's a new, entirely new brand, you know what to do. You have the playbook and you know what it costs and you know what to do and you know how to market and all those things. I think when it comes to uh, mobile and internet-focused products, it's very, very difficult to know what works and doesn't work in advance. And I think part of it is that the internet changes so quickly that things that worked a few years ago might not work today. And I think also that things that didn't work a few years ago might work today. And also, a lot of the things that have turned out to be wildly successful were ideas that seemed really dumb initially. So people were very dismissive of Twitter or Facebook or uh, you know, Snapchat. People were also very dismissive of Android people were dismissive of the iPhone. So a lot of the things that have turned out to be massively successful products and platforms uh, were, were, at the time, there were a lot of people who thought, well, this will never work, it's too dumb. And so 
if you look at the macro level, if you look and see what has worked, what, is, uh, what products have worked and what haven't, there's a lot of experimentation, there's a lot of throwing things against the wall. And one reason we've had so much innovation that's come out of the technology space is that we have so many people trying different things. So you have a thousand experiments. You go on Product Hunt, you see dozens and dozens of things every day. 99% of those things are never gonna go anywhere. Um, but the point is we have people trying and we have people experimenting. We have people you know, seeing uh, what they can build and, and, and seeing whether there's an audience for it. And so what I argued is that you know, at AOL, there are things that we know how to do well. Uh, but what we haven't been so great at is building breakout new mobile products, for example. And so what I said was, uh, when I'm my, in my strategy role, <laughs> I argued we need to be taking a lot of swings at the bat, doing a lot of experiments, putting a lot of things out there, and seeing if they can find an audience. It's, you know, find product, if, whether we can find a product market fit. And we have to be prepared to fail a lot. And we have to be comfortable with the idea that we could do a half dozen products and all of them could fail. Now, they'll all be good products. And I think that if you look at Product Hunt, most of those products are pretty good. They're well designed, they work, they're, you know, they, they do what they set out to do. They just might not, there might be something about them that um, either is the timing's wrong or they don't connect with the audience or there's not enough people that, you know, care or that need that product. But it's, uh, uh, Without taking those risks and, and building things and trying to see uh, whether or not people will care or want it, um, you know, you have to be able, you have to be prepared to put things out there and test. And it's really hard to do market research uh, or to do audience uh, focus groups and those sorts of things in advance. It's, I've never, you know, I've never seen um, a company, uh, a mobile startup, you know, start with a, a focus group, mm -hmm. right? Um, they put things out there. And, and I think if you look at our, you know, um, uh, other companies like Facebook or Google or Twitter, um, they're doing experiments too, right? I mean, Facebook is building a lot of experiments and they have a much bigger team than I do um, and much more uh, the people running their their team are much smarter than me uh, and much more capable, but um, we're doing the best we can. And I think that the the two products that we put out so far, I'm really proud of, and I and I, I I like a lot. And when I look at our pipeline, we have a lot of really cool stuff coming up. Whether any of it will be a success, I have no idea. Mm. So we're sitting in the presence of a bona fide consumer electronics expert. Let's play a quick game okay. where I'm going to name some of the most talked about gadgets and tech coming up. And I want you to just tell me whether you think there'll be a fail or a win. Okay. Simple. The Apple Watch. Win. That's easy. Express shipping via drones. Fail. Self-driving cars. Win. Jay-Z's new premium music service title. Fail. Smart glasses. Oh, we have to caveat with that. Uh, Google Glass will fail, but I think uh, we will see more... Smart eyewear in the future. Smart eyewear in the future, but probably more enterprise business than consumer. Gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs>